Howdy y'all, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to continue in our Old World series where we look into some of the oldest and most important cities found throughout the world, focusing mainly on North America and a search for their oldest known photographs. Today will be a very enthralling video, I believe, which I may actually have to turn into two separate videos because of all these amazing images that I was able to find. For preference, if you don't want to hear about the current narrative or my thoughts on it, you can mute the video now and just view these images at your own pace. Without further ado, these will be roughly 300 of the oldest, rarest, and most unique images of Old World Toronto, Ontario, Canada. In my previous Old World videos, we have focused on Ottawa, Canada, but in today's video, we're going to take a deep dive into looking at the oldest and most unique photographs of Toronto, formerly known as York, while discussing the current narrative history behind this massive Canadian powerhouse. Sitting along the northern coastline of Lake Ontario, Toronto is the capital of the Ontario province, and with a city population of 2.7 million people and growing, Toronto is also Canada's most populated city and the fourth most populated city in all of North America. Including the greater Toronto area proper, Toronto has a population of over 6.4 million people. The name Toronto comes from a Mohawk Native American word, meaning place where trees stand in water. However, the original British name for the area known today as Toronto was actually York. This is of particular interest to me when we look at the British royalty and rule and the War of the Roses between the houses of York and Lancaster. I grew up in South Central Pennsylvania and frequently found myself seeing the influence of the red and white roses as I traveled between York and Lancaster counties. In this case, we are told York, Upper Canada, was so named for Frederick, Duke of York and Albany. However, I digress on that for just a moment as I'd like to briefly touch on the Native American populations which seem to have greatly influenced this area. Toronto has a very interesting history, right from the get-go. We are told in the current narrative that the history of Toronto begins immediately following the end of the last official ice age in roughly the 13th century BC. Now before that time period, all of the land that today encompasses Toronto was under a thick ice sheet. Now as the ice sheet receded, Around roughly the 9th century BC, we are told that the first human occupants to the area began to move in. Many of their ancient remains are still being discovered today along the ancient coastlines of Lake Ontario. We are told around the 6th century BC, the climate in the area warmed drastically, changing to a temperate climate, essentially bringing the four seasons to the Toronto region, which had a diverse effect on the wildlife and ecosystems of the area. We are told that the First Nations of Toronto were fishing camps that were established beginning in roughly 1000 BC. 500 years later, by 500 BC, up to 500 people are said to have been living in the area that is today Toronto. The First Nations are said to have developed extensive traveling routes, which in their own right should be researched. These routes connected Western Canada the whole way to the Gulf of Mexico. Interesting to say the least. And this bit of information certainly seems to add to the questionable narrative of all of these ancient discoveries. And this becomes even more clear to me when we identify that one of the groups of indigenous people who originally settled in the Toronto area with much success were members of the ancient mound builders. Now, as time progresses in nearly all of the old world narratives, we have distinctions being made between the ancient groups of Native Americans. Yet, in nearly every video that I've made, on very popular and modern cities when we look into their roots and their oldest history, we find that they seem to all stem from the same Native American group, the ancient mound builders. The work of these ancient groups, and more specifically, 
the groups who actually constructed the mounds and the earthworks that the cities are built on top of. This seemed to become the actual foundation for the major cities that is still used today. And it leads us to wonder about the vast nature of this one First Nation culture of Native Americans. Could they really be the ancestors of every single Native American group that we see throughout the country. It's just food for thought, but interesting when it seems that many of these areas were built upon first by the ancient mound builders and then by following generations of other Native American groups. Hopefully that wasn't too convoluted to understand, but I digress on that for a minute. Diving back into the current narrative, we are told that by 600 Common Era, southern crops like corn had made their way to the Toronto region. By 900, the first Iroquois villages sprung up in the Toronto area, and it's written that these Iroquois villages in Toronto were created on high, fortified pieces of land, much like mounds. Now, we are told around 1200, the Huron Native Americans also entered the northern Toronto area, and by 1500, most of the other Iroquois are said to have migrated north into the specifically Huron Nation. And around this time period is when many ancient Native settlements, including earthworks and mounds, were being created in the greater Toronto area. Now, one of these mounds that still exists today is known as Tabor Hill. By the early 1700s, Toronto Native Americans began receiving traded goods from the Europeans as the first European settlers and explorers began to reach the greater Toronto area. However, with this quick and massive uptick in trade, it is said the Native American populations were decimated by disease. And these were diseases that were brought by the Europeans that the Native American groups had really never experienced before. It is said half of the First Nation population of Toronto passed away during this time period. The Huron Nation, who were the dominant group in Toronto at the time, actually fled the area and went north. And the remaining Native American groups stayed behind, and more specifically of these groups, the Seneca, one of the five nations of the Iroquois, created two large settlements in the area that is today Toronto. Now, by the 1720s, it is written, the French had begun to explore the Toronto area and it quickly became a location of interest for them due to the vast fur and fertile hunting grounds available. The fur trade in this area boomed right around the 1720s and what followed was an extreme back and forth between the British and the French who each built trading camps and forts. However, this back and forth would soon cease with the end of the Seven Years' War and the Treaty of Paris, which would cede New France and the area that is today Toronto from the French to the British. Under the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which functioned much like ancient Roman law, Lord Dorchester of Great Britain attempted to purchase 250,000 acres from the Mississauga, who were said to be the last native nation to be occupying the land of Toronto. In a nutshell, the Royal British Crown wanted to have a document declaring the massive lands of Toronto and the surrounding areas as their own. This goes back to one of the most important terms, in my opinion, in all of life, that being plausible deniability. It's a key function in nearly every law, and this is no exception. If the Mississauga sell their land to the British, the British would basically have the right to do whatever they want on the land with little to no repercussions. To have a treaty or a document signed would give the British plausible deniability in any action that they would commit. However, this is where it becomes really interesting. The Mississauga nation are said to have repeatedly denied the British attempt to purchase the land. Essentially, for over 200 years, Toronto was built on not only ancient mounds, but on the disputed lands of the Mississauga people. Only in 2010 was the dispute over the land finally settled, with the Canadian government agreeing to a roughly $117 million payment.
So now we're going to speed up the timeline just a little bit to try and catch up to more modern times. I did find it very important to note that the original name of Toronto was York. Now, the original capital of Upper Canada, which was picked by Dorchester himself, who I mentioned earlier, was deemed unsuitable as a permanent capital just a few years later by John Graves Simcoe in the year of 1793. Simcoe was the first lieutenant governor of the newly organized Upper Canada, and he wanted to pick a new location for his official capital. Originally, he moved the capital to the disputed lands of the Toronto Purchase only temporarily, hoping to find a more concrete capital later on. However, by 1796, it is said, Toronto was officially made the capital of Upper Canada, and the search was finished. Simcoe, however, being a diehard British loyalist, did not want to use the name Toronto that the Mohawk Nation had basically come up with. Instead, he wanted to adopt a more British moniker, and he chose the name of York for his new town. Simcoe was a very interesting man to say the least. He hired someone to lay out the town of York, only to then disregard those designs and develop his very own plan. The first two streets laid out in all of York, or all of Toronto, were the streets of Dundas and Young, both of which were designed by Simcoe, and both of which still exist much in the same route today. The town was fledgling in the late 1700s, having less than 200 people. We are told finding workers to expand the town was very difficult. Slavery was legal at the time. However, Simcoe did something quite amazing. While he was unable to completely abolish slavery in York, he did enact laws which made all men legally free by the age of 25 and he outlawed the practice of going into slavery following his decree, meaning all current men would be free by the age of 25 and no new people would be allowed to enter into slavery. So before leaving York to head back to Great Britain, Simcoe would go on to put Peter Russell in charge of the town of York, and we're told that Peter Russell would go on to help develop many of the firsts in this town, including the first jail, the first market, and the first cathedral. Now, we fast forward a little bit, and this is where things get dicey, to say the least. An aspect of both Canadian and American history that I have seldom heard discussed, after the outbreak of the War of 1812, American forces are said to have set out to capture British Canadian capitals. According to the mainstream narrative, Zebulon Pike, an American soldier, on April 27, 1813, set out to attempt to capture the capital of Upper Canada by taking over the large fort that defended the town. This town was York, and the fort was aptly named Fort York. The British who were apparently unprepared for this invasion, are said to have fled the town. But before abandoning the fort at York, it's written that they set fire to the massive bunker containing the fort's ammunition. Within moments of Zebulon Pike and his American troops arriving at Fort York, the fort was completely obliterated when the ammunitions detonated. Zebulon, his soldiers, the fort, and large parts of Yorktown as a whole were destroyed during the ensuing explosion. The blast was recorded as having injured civilians and damaged property up to 30 miles away. So, if we look at this from a slightly different perspective, during the time we can say that the majority of whatever was housed in Yorktown was decimated, meaning any old world ruins including Old Fort York, are completely destroyed. Any remnants of a past civilization, including ancient native works, appear to be heavily damaged at the time. Interestingly, we are told that the Americans 
became enraged with the explosion at Fort York and what happened to Mr. Pike. And thus, the Americans sent large reinforcements to York in retaliation and completely destroyed what remained of Yorktown. Now, this is where the narrative skips ahead quite a bit, and this is where I'm going to try to wrap up the current narrative concepts so we can achieve some peaceful viewing of these old world images. After the War of 1812 and what happened to the town of York, the narrative then skips ahead to the changing of the name of York to Toronto, which is said to have occurred on March the 6th, 1834. Apparently, this was done to differentiate York from New York City and the dozens of other smaller locations named after the York royal family line. The name was reverted back to the ancient Mohawk native name for the land, which was Toronto, the name that we still use today. Now it's interesting because we are told that Toronto had a real problem with mud in these earliest days of the rebuild. One of the most well-known nicknames for Toronto in the mid-1800s was Muddy York. According to the current narrative, the unpaved streets would often flood, but the flood was not necessarily just water. It was often a mixture of mud and water, which would cause the streets to become uneven and swamp-like. I point this out because we are told by the 1840s one of the first projects done by the city of Toronto was to create and pave the streets so less mud would accumulate. Yet, when we look at many of these photographs from the 1860s, 1870s, and later, we see that the streets are still very much covered in mud. Not all of them, but many of the streets still appear to be unpaved or unfinished. And this becomes even more interesting when we note that the current narrative tells us that the city of Toronto had such amenities like streetlights by the early 1840s. It's little facts like these about the different old world cities that I find absolutely worth note. Things that make us question the narrative as it's being presented to us. Now, just like many other old world cities, Toronto realized a time of extreme growth through the mid to late 1800s. We have a population in Toronto of 30,000 people in 1851, 56,000 people in 1871, 86,000 people in 1881, and 181,000 people by 1891. The first rail lines arrived to Toronto beginning in the 1850s and with the growth of the city also came advancements in architecture which are echoed throughout these photographs. In 1879, the first Toronto Industrial Exhibition was held in Toronto which included a massive crystal palace. During the mid-1800s, Toronto became a bastion for immigration, a melting pot of different cultures, with one of the most notable being the Irish, who arrived to Toronto after the Great Irish Famine. The Irish of Toronto and their Orange Order, a fraternal order, helped to shape the city of Toronto throughout the 1800s, not only physically, with their labor and architecture, but also mentally and spiritually, with their many contributions to daily life in Toronto. So now let us just take a look at some of these unique old world images of Toronto. I'm gonna chime out here for a minute and just let you view these images at your own pace. They are all very interesting. Note the large blocks, the masonry work, Note the domes and the pillars and the spires on all of these old world buildings and wonder how or why they were constructed in such a way. These are very beautiful and it's interesting to note that these would all seemingly come after the rebuild, after the War of 1812. So just really interesting images here. There will be a few from the early 1900s as well and just let me know your thoughts or your opinions down below and we'll continue with the video here shortly.
So here is as good a place as any to end part one on this topic of old world Toronto and these beautiful images of this amazing architecture in this old world city. Now, part two of this video is going to be really important and it's going to showcase some of the craziest images I have ever seen of really any old world city. And these are going to be images after the Great Fire of 1904 in Toronto, which basically left the city looking like a war zone. You may have seen some of these images before, but I doubt that you have seen all of them. So please come back and join me for part two.